The Herb of Death by Agatha Christie. Now then, Mrs. B, said Sir Henry Clithering encouragingly. Mrs. Bantry, his hostess, looked at him in cold reproof. I've told you before that I will not be called Mrs. B. It's not dignified. Shares are they then? And even less, I am sh. What's her name? I never can tell a story properly. Ask Arthur if you don't believe me. You're quite good at the facts, Dolly," said Colonel Bantry, "but poor at the embroidery." That's just it," said Mrs. Bantry. She flapped the bulb catalogue she was holding on the table in front of her. "I've been listening to you all, and I don't know how you do it." He said, she said, you wondered. They thought, everyone implied. Well, I just couldn't, and there it is. And besides, I don't know anything to tell a story about. We can't believe that, Mrs. Bantry," said Doctor Lloyd. He shook his grey head in mocking disbelief. Old Miss Marple said in her gentle voice, "Surely, dear." Mrs. Bantry continued obstinately to shake her head. "You don't know how banal my life is. What with the servants and the difficulties of getting scullery maids, and just going to town for clothes and dentists and Ascot, which Arthur hates, and then the garden." "Ah," said Doctor Lloyd, "the garden. We all know where your heart lies, Mrs. Bantry." It must be nice to have a garden," said Jane Hallier, the beautiful young actress. "That is, if you hadn't got to dig, or to get your hands messed up. I'm ever so fond of flowers." "The garden," said Sir Henry. "Can't we take that as a starting point? Come, Mrs. B. The poison bulb, the deadly daffodils, the herb of death. Now." It's odd you're saying that," said Mrs. Bantry. "You've just reminded me, Arthur. Do you remember that business at Clodderham Court? You know, old Sir Ambrose Bercy. Do you remember what a courtly, charming old man we thought him? Why, of course. Yes, that was a strange business. Go ahead, Dolly. You would better tell it, dear. Nonsense." Go ahead, must paddle your own canoe. I did my bit just now. Mrs. Bantry drew a deep breath. She clasped her hands and her face registered complete mental anguish. She spoke rapidly and fluently. Well, there's really not much to tell. The herb of death—that's what put it into my head. Though in my own mind, I call it sage and onions. Sage and onions," asked Doctor Lloyd. Mrs. Bantry nodded. "That was how it happened, you see," she explained. "We were staying, Arthur and I, with Sir Ambrose Bercy at Clodderham Court, and one day, by mistake, though very stupidly, I've always thought, a lot of foxglove leaves were picked with the sage. The ducks for dinner that night were stuffed with it, and everyone was very ill, and one poor girl." Sir Ambrose's ward died of it. She stopped. Dear, dear," said Miss Marple, "how very tragic. Wasn't it?" Well," said Sir Henry, "what next?" There isn't any next," said Mrs. Bantry. "That's all." Everyone gasped. Though warned beforehand, they had not expected quite such brevity as this. But my dear lady," remonstrated Sir Henry, "it can't be all. What you have related is a tragic occurrence, but not in any sense of the word a problem." Well, of course, there's some more," said Mrs. Bantry. "But if I were to tell you, you would know what it was." She looked defiantly round the assembly and said plaintively. I told you I couldn't dress things up and make it sound properly like a story ought to do. Ha ha," said Sir Henry. He sat up in his chair and adjusted an eyeglass. Really, 
You know, Shahzade, this is most refreshing. Our ingenuity is challenged. I'm not so sure you haven't done it on purpose to stimulate our curiosity. A few brisk rounds of twenty questions is indicated. I think, Miss Marple, will you begin? I would like to know something about the cook," said Miss Marple. "She must have been a very stupid woman, or else very inexperienced." "She was just very stupid," said Mrs. Bantry. "She cried a great deal afterwards and said the leaves had been picked and brought in to her as sage, and how was she to know?" "Not one who thought for herself," said Miss Marple. "Probably an elderly woman." And I dare say a very good cook. Oh, excellent," said Mrs. Bantry. "Your turn, Miss Hellier," said Sir Henry. "Oh, you mean to ask a question?" There was a pause while Jane pondered. Finally, she said helplessly, "Freely, I don't know what to ask." Her beautiful eyes looked appealingly at Sir Henry. Why not dramatis personae, Miss Hillier? He suggested, smiling. Jane still looked puzzled. Characters in order of their appearance, said Sir Henry gently. Oh yes, said Jane. That's a good idea. Mrs. Bantry began briskly to tick people off on her fingers. Sir Ambrose, Sylvia Keene. That's the girl who died. A friend of hers who was staying there, Maud Y, one of those dark, ugly girls who manage to make an effort somehow. I never know how they do it. Then there was Mister Curl, who had come down to discuss books with Sir Ambrose. You know, rare books, queer old things in Latin, all musty parchment. There was Jerry Lorimer. He was a kind of next door neighbour. His place, Fairleys, joined Sir Ambrose's estate, and there was Mrs. Carpenter, one of those middle-aged pussies who always seem to manage to dig themselves in comfortably somewhere. She was by way of being Dame de Compagnie to Sylvia, I suppose. If it is my turn, said Sir Henry, and I suppose it is, as I'm sitting next to Miss Hellier, I want a good deal. I want a short verbal portrait, please, Mrs. Bantry, of all the foregoing. Oh, Mrs. Bantry hesitated. Sir Ambrose now, continued Sir Henry. Start with him. What was he like? Oh, he was a very distinguished-looking old man, and not so very old, really, not more than sixty, I suppose, but he was very delicate. He had a weak heart, could never go upstairs. He had to have a lift put in, and so that made him seem older than he was. Very charming manners, courtly—that's the word that describes him best. You never saw him ruffled or upset. He had beautiful white hair and a particularly charming voice. Good," said Sir Henry. "I see, Sir Ambrose. Now the girl, Sylvia." What did you say her name was? Sylvia Keene. She was pretty, really very pretty, fair head, you know, and a lovely skin. Not perhaps very clever, in fact, rather stupid. Oh, come, Dolly," protested her husband. Arthur, of course, wouldn't think so," said Mrs. Bantry dryly. But she was stupid. She really never said anything worth listening to. One of the most graceful creatures I ever saw," said Colonel Bantry warmly. "See her playing tennis, charming, simply charming, and she was full of fun, most amusing little thing, and such a pretty way with her. I bet the young fellows all thought so." "That's just where you are wrong," said Mrs. Bantry. Youth, as such, has no charms for young men nowadays. It's only old buffers like you, Arthur, who sit maundering on about young girls. Being young is no good," said Jane. 
You've got to have S.A. What? said Miss Marble. Is S.A.? Sex appeal, said Jane. Ah, yes, said Miss Marple. What in my day they used to call having the come hither in your eye. Not a bad description, said Sir Henry. The dame de compagnie you described, I think, as a pussy, Mrs. Bantry. I didn't mean a cat, you know, said Mrs. Bantry. It's quite different. Just a big, soft, white, purry person. Always very sweet. That's what Adelaide Carpenter was like. What sort of aged woman? Oh, I should say fortish. She had been there some time, ever since Sylvia was eleven, I believe. A very tactful person. One of those widows left in unfortunate circumstances with plenty of aristocratic relations, but no ready cash. I didn't like her myself, but then I never did like people with very white long hands, and I don't like pussies. Mr. Curl? Oh, one of those elderly stooping men. There are so many of them about, you would hardly know one from the other. He showed enthusiasm when talking about his musty books, but not at any other time. I don't think Sir Ambrose knew him very well. And Jerry next door? A freely charming boy. He was engaged to Sylvia. That's what made it so sad. Now I wonder, began Miss Marple, and then stopped. What? Nothing, dear. Sir Henry looked at the old lady curiously. Then he said thoughtfully, So, this young couple were engaged. Had they been engaged long? About a year. Sir Ambrose had opposed the engagement on the plea that Sylvia was too young. But after a year's engagement he had given in, and the marriage was to have taken place quite soon. Huh! Had the young lady any property? Next to nothing. A bare hundred or two a year. No rat in that hole, Clithering, said Sir Colonel Bantry, and laughed. It's the doctor's turn to ask a question, said Sir Henry. I stand down. My curiosity is mainly professional, said Dr. Lloyd. I should like to know what medical evidence were given at the inquest. That is, if our hostess remembers, or indeed, if she knows. I know roughly, said Mrs. Bantry. It was poisoning by digitalin. Is that right? Dr. Lloyd nodded. The active principle of the foxglove, digitalis. Acts on the heart. Indeed, it is a very valuable drug in some forms of heart trouble. A very curious case altogether. I would never have believed that eating a preparation of foxglove's leaves could possibly result fatally. These ideas of eating poisonous leaves and berries are very much exaggerated. Very few people realize that the vital principle or alkaloid has to be extracted with much care and preparation. Mrs. MacArthur sent some special bulbs round to Mrs. Toomey the other day, said Miss Marple, and Mrs. Toomey's cook mistook them for onions, and all the Toomeys were very ill indeed. But they didn't die of it, said Dr. Lloyd. No, they didn't die of it, admitted Miss Marple. A girl I knew died of tamane poisoning, said Jane Halier. We must get on with investigating the crime, said Sir Henry. Crime? said Jane, startled. I thought it was an accident. If it were an accident, said Sir Henry gently, I do not think Mrs. Bantry would have told us the story. No, as I read it, This was an accident only in appearance. Behind it is something more sinister. I remember a case. Various guests in a house party were chatting after dinner. The walls were adorned with all kinds of old-fashioned weapons, 
Entirely as a joke, one of the party seized an ancient horse pistol and pointed it at another man, pretending to fire it. The pistol was loaded and went off, killing the man. We had to ascertain in that case, first, who had secretly prepared and loaded that pistol, and secondly, who had so led and directed the conversation that that final bit of horseplay resulted. For the man who had fired the pistol was entirely innocent. It seems to me we have much the same problem here. Those digitalin leaves were deliberately mixed with the sage, knowing what the result would be. Since we exonerate the cook, we do exonerate the cook, don't we? The question arises, who picked the leaves and delivered them to the kitchen? That's easily answered, said Mrs. Bantry. At least the last part of it is. It was Sylvia herself who took the leaves to the kitchen. It was part of a daily job to gather things like salad or herbs, bunches of young carrots, all the sort of things that gardeners never pick right. They hate giving you anything young and tender. They wait for them to be fine specimens. Sylvia and Mrs. Carpenter used to see to a lot of these things themselves. And there was foxglove actually growing all amongst the sage in one corner. So the mistake was quite natural. But did Sylvia actually pick them herself? That nobody ever knew. It was assumed so. Assumptions, said Sir Henry, are dangerous things. But I do know that Mrs. Carpenter did not pick them, said Mrs. Bantry, because, as it happened, she was walking with me on the terrace that morning. We went out there after breakfast. It was unusually nice and warm for early spring. Sylvia went alone down into the garden, but later I saw her walking arm in arm with Maud Y. So they were great friends, were they? asked Miss Marple. Yes, said Mrs. Bantry. She seemed as though about to say something, but did not do so. Had she been staying there long? asked Miss Marple. About a fortnight, said Mrs. Bantry. There was a note of trouble in her voice. You didn't like Miss Y, suggested Sir Henry. I did. That's just it. I did. The trouble in her voice had grown to distress. You're keeping something back, Mrs. Bantry, said Sir Henry accusingly. I wondered just now, said Miss Marple, but I didn't like to go on. When did you wonder? When you said that the young people were engaged. You said that that was what made it so sad. But, if you know what I mean, your voice didn't sound right when you said it. Not convincing, you know. What a dreadful person you are, said Mrs. Bantry. You always seem to know. Yes, I was thinking of something. But I don't really know whether I ought to say it or not. You must say it, said Sir Henry. Whatever your scruples, it mustn't be kept back. Well, it was just this, said Mrs. Bantry. One evening, in fact, the very evening before the tragedy, I happened to go out on the terrace before dinner. The window in the drawing room was open, and as it chanced, I saw Jerry Lorimer and Maud Y. He was, well, kissing her. Of course, I didn't know whether it was just a sort of chance affair, or whether, well, I mean, one can't tell. I knew Sir Ambrose never had really liked Jerry Lorimer, so perhaps he knew he was that kind of young man. But one thing I am sure of, that girl, Maud Y, was really fond of him. You would only see her looking at him when she was off guard. And I think, too, they were really better suited than he and Sylvia were. I am going to ask a question quickly, before Miss Marple can, said Sir Henry. I want to know whether, after the tragedy, Jerry Lorimer married Maud Wye. 
Yes, said Mrs. Mantry. He did, six months afterwards. Oh, Sherzade, Sherzade, said Sir Henry. To think of the way you told us the story at first. Bare bones indeed. And to think of the amount of flesh we are finding on them now. Don't speak so ghoulishly, said Mrs. Bantry. And don't use the word flesh. Vegetarians always do. They say, I never eat flesh in a way that puts you right off your little beef steak. Mr. Curl was a vegetarian. He used to eat some peculiar stuff that looked like bran for breakfast. Those elderly stooping men with beards are often faddy. They have patent kinds of underwear too. What on earth, Dolly? said her husband. Do you know about Mr. Curl's underwear? Nothing, said Mrs. Mantry with dignity. I was just making a guess. I'll amend my former statement, said Sir Henry. I say instead that the dramatist persona in your problem are very interesting. I'm beginning to see them all. Hey, Miss Marple? Human nature is always interesting, Sir Henry, and it's curious to see how certain types always tend to act in exactly the same way. Two women and a man, said Sir Henry, the old eternal human triangle. Is that the base of our problem here? I rather fancy it is. Dr. Lloyd cleared his throat. I've been thinking, he said rather diffidently. Do you say, Mrs. Bantry, that you yourself were ill? Was I not? So was Arthur. So was everyone. That's just it. Everyone, said the doctor. You see what I mean? In Sir Henry's story, which he told her just now, one man shot another. He didn't have to shoot the whole room full. I don't understand, said Jane. Who shot who? I'm saying that whoever planned this thing went about it very curiously, either with a blind belief in chance or else with an absolutely reckless disregard for human life. I can hardly believe there is a man capable of deliberately poisoning eight people with the object of removing one amongst them. I see your point, said Sir Henry, thoughtfully. I confess I ought to have thought of that. And might not he have poisoned himself too? asked Jane. Was anyone absent from dinner that night? asked Miss Marple. Mrs. Bantry shook her head. Everyone was there. Except Mr. Lorimer, I suppose, my dear. He wasn't staying in the house, was he? No, but he was dining there that evening, said Mrs. Mantry. Oh, said Miss Marble in a changed voice. That makes all the difference in the world. She frowned vexedly to herself. I have been very stupid, she murmured. Very stupid indeed. I confess your point worries me, Lloyd, said Sir Henry. How ensure that the girl, and the girl only, should get a fatal dose? You can't, said the doctor. That brings me to the point I'm going to make. Supposing the girl was not the intended victim after all? What? In all cases of food poisoning, the result is very uncertain. Several people share a dish. What happens? One or two are slightly ill. Two more, say, are seriously indisposed. One dies. That's the way of it. There's no certainty anywhere. But there are cases where another factor might enter in. Digitalin is a drug that acts directly on the heart. As I've told you, it's prescribed in certain cases. Now, there was one person in the house who suffered from a heart complaint. Suppose he was the victim selected? What would not be fatal to the rest would be fatal to him.
or so the murderer might reasonably suppose. That the thing turned out differently is only a proof of what I was saying just now. The uncertainty and unreliability of the effects of drugs on human beings. Sir Ambrose, said Sir Henry, you think he was the person aimed at? Yes, yes, and the girl's death was a mistake. Who got his money after he was dead? asked Jane. A very sound question, Miss Halia. One of the first we always ask in my late profession, said Sir Henry. Sir Ambrose had a son, said Mrs. Mantry slowly. He had quarrelled with him many years previously. The boy was wild, I believe. Still, it was not in Sir Ambrose's power to disinherit him. Clodderham Court was entailed. Martin Bercy succeeded to the title and estate. There was, however, a good deal of other property that Sir Ambrose could leave as he chose and that he left to his ward, Sylvia. I know this, because Sir Ambrose died less than a year after the events I am telling you of, and he had not troubled to make a new will after Sylvia's death. I think the money went to the crown, or perhaps it was to his son as next of kin. I don't really remember. So it was only to the interest of a son who wasn't there, and the girl who died herself to make away with him, said Sir Henry thoughtfully. That doesn't seem very promising. Didn't the other woman get anything? asked Jane. The one Mrs. Bantry calls the pussy woman? She wasn't mentioned in the will, said Mrs. Bantry. Miss Marble, you are not listening, said Sir Henry. You are somewhere far away. I was thinking of old Mr. Batcher, the chemist, said Miss Marble. He had a very young housekeeper, young enough to be not only his daughter, but his granddaughter. Not a word to anyone, and his family, a lot of nephews and nieces, full of expectations. And when he died, would you believe it? He had been secretly married to her for two years. Of course, Mr. Badger was a chemist, and a very rude, common old man as well, and Sir Ambrose Bercy was a very courtly gentleman, so Mrs. Bantry says, but for all that human nature is much the same everywhere. There was a pause. Sir Henry looked very hard at Miss Marple, who looked back at him with gently quizzical blue eyes. Jane Hillier broke the silence. Was this Mrs. Carpenter good-looking? she asked. Yes, in a very quiet way. Nothing startling. She had a very sympathetic voice, said Colonel Bantry. Parring, that's what I call it, said Mrs. Bantry. Parring. You will be called a cat yourself one of these days, Dolly. I like being a cat in my home circle, said Mrs. Bantry. I don't much like women anyway, and you know it. I like men and flowers. Excellent taste, said Sir Henry, especially in putting men first. That was tact, said Mrs. Bantry. Well, now, what about my little problem? I have been quite fair, I think. Arthur. Don't you think I've been fair? Yes, my dear. I don't think there will be any inquiry into the running by the stewards of the jockey club. First boy, said Mrs. Mantry, pointing a finger at Sir Henry. I am going to be long-winded, because, you see, I haven't really got any feeling of certainty about the matter. First, Sir Ambrose. Well, he wouldn't take such an original method of committing suicide, and on the other hand, he certainly had nothing to gain by the death of his ward. Exit Sir Ambrose. Mr. Curl, no motive for death of girl. If Sir Ambrose was intended victim, 
he might possibly have purloined a rare manuscript or two that no one else would miss. Very thin and most unlikely. So I think that in spite of Mrs. Bantry's suspicions as to his underclothing, Mr. Curl is cleared. Miss Y. Motive for death of Sir Ambrose? None. Motive for death of Sylvia? Pretty strong. She wanted Sylvia's young man, and wanted him rather badly, from Mrs. Bantry's account. She was with Sylvia that morning in the garden, so had opportunity to pick leaves. No, we can't dismiss Miss Y so easily. Young Lorimer, he's got a motive in either case. If he gets rid of his sweetheart, he can marry the other girl. Still, it seems a bit drastic to kill her. What's a broken engagement these days? If Sir Ambrose dies, he will marry a rich girl instead of a poor one. That might be important or not. Depends on his financial position. If I find that his estate was heavily mortgaged and that Mrs. Bantry has deliberately withheld that fact from us, I shall claim a foul. Now, Mrs. Carpenter. You know, I have suspicions of Mrs. Carpenter. Those white hands, for one thing, and her excellent alibi at the time the herbs were picked. I always distrust alibis. And I've got another reason for suspecting her which I will keep to myself. Still, on the whole, if I've got to plump, I shall plump for Miss Maud Y, because there is more evidence against her than anyone else. Next boy, said Mrs. Mantry, and pointed at Dr. Lloyd. I think you're wrong, Clithering, in sticking to the theory that the girl's death was meant. I am convinced that the murderer intended to do away with Sir Ambrose. I don't think that young Lorimer had the necessary knowledge. I am inclined to believe that Mrs. Carpenter was the guilty party. She had been a long time with the family, knew all about the state of Sir Ambrose's health, and could easily arrange for this girl Sylvia, who you said yourself was rather stupid, to pick the right leaves. Motive, I confess, I don't see. But I hazard the guess that Sir Ambrose had one time made a will in which she was mentioned. That's the best I can do. Mrs. Bantry's pointing finger went on to Jane Halier. I don't know what to say, said Jane, except this. Why shouldn't the girl herself have done it? She took the leaves into the kitchen after all. And you say Sir Ambrose had been sticking out against her marriage. If he died, she would get the money and be able to marry at once. She would know just as much about Sir Ambrose's health as Mrs. Carpenter would. Mrs. Bantry's finger came slowly round to Miss Marble. Now then, school ma'am, she said. Sir Henry has put in all very clearly. Very clearly indeed said Miss Marble. And Dr. Lloyd was so right in what he said. Between them, they may seem to have made things so very clear. Only, I don't think Dr. Lloyd quite realized one aspect of what he said. You see, not being Sir Ambrose's medical adviser, he couldn't know just what kind of heart trouble Sir Ambrose had. Could he? I don't quite see what you mean, Miss Marble, said Dr. Lloyd. You are assuming, aren't you, that Sir Ambrose had the kind of heart that digitalin would affect adversely? But there's nothing to prove that that's so. It might be just the other way about. The other way about? Yes, you did say that it was often prescribed for heart trouble. Even then, Miss Marple, I don't see what that leads to. Well, it would mean that he would have digitalin in his possession quite naturally, without having to account for it. What I'm trying to say, and I always express myself so badly, is this. Supposing you wanted to poison anyone with a fatal dose of digitalin, wouldn't the simplest and easiest way be to arrange for everyone to be poisoned 
actually by digital in leaves? It wouldn't be fatal in anyone else's case, of course, but no one would be surprised at one victim because, as Dr. Lloyd said, these things are so uncertain. No one would be likely to ask whether the girl had actually had a fatal dose of infusion of digitalis or something of that kind. He might have put it in a cocktail or in her coffee or even made her drink it quite simply as a tonic. You mean Sir Ambrose poisoned his ward, the charming girl whom he loved? That's just it, said Miss Marple. Like Mr. Badger and his young housekeeper. Don't tell me it's absurd for a man of sixty to fall in love with a girl of twenty. It happens every day, and I dare say with an old autocrat like Sir Ambrose, it might take him queerly. These things become a madness sometimes. He couldn't bear the thought of her getting married, did his best to oppose it, and failed. His mad jealousy became so great that he preferred killing her to letting her go to young Lorimer. He must have thought of it some time beforehand, because that foxglove seed would have to be sown among the sage. He would pick it himself when the time came, and send her into the kitchen with it. It's horrible to think of, but I suppose we must take as merciful a view of it as we can. Gentlemen of that age are sometimes very peculiar indeed, where young girls are concerned. Our last organist, but there, I shouldn't talk scandal. Mrs. Bantry, said Sir Henry, is this so? Mrs. Bantry nodded. Yes, I had no idea of it, never dreamed of the thing being anything but an accident. Then, after Sir Ambrose's death, I got a letter. He had left directions to send it to me. He told me the truth in it. I don't know why, but he and I always got on very well together. In the momentary silence, she seemed to feel an unspoken criticism and went on hastily. You think I'm betraying a confidence, but that isn't so. I've changed all the names. He wasn't really called Sir Ambrose Bercy. Didn't you see how Arthur stared stupidly when I said that name to him? He didn't understand at first. I've changed everything. It's like they say in magazines and in the beginnings of books. All the characters in the story are purely fictitious. You never know who they really are. The End <laughs>